Do you think that we need 500 different English Bibles? No, in fact, I, I mentioned uh, we have a glut. We don't have any need for any, any more. I don't think there's a good reason for why we've had the explosion of them over the past number of decades. I know what the reason is. Right. It's real simple. It's, it's, it's the fact that if you have a publishing house and you want to do a study Bible or something, which I am not a study Bible fan. Me neither. What they did is if you were a major publishing house, you didn't want to have to pay royalties to somebody else. So they all made their own translations. Right. There is a financial motivation to come out with all these different versions. There is. No mm -hmm. question about it. Right. No question about it. Um, does God expect the average Christian For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. Even the corruption of the word of God was going on in Paul's day. So the NIV says, unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. Oh, yeah, they do. In fact, that's why they print all these new Bibles all the time. You know why? So they can copyright them. So that if you quote from them, you have to pay them a dime. It's all, see, the Bible says the love of money, love of money is the root of all evil. Notice, and we're supposed to somewhere hear God's voice in here. That same reading is also found in the New King James Version of the Bible. Mark chapter 10. And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that do what? Trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. And yet the NIV says how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. I'm telling you, it's not hard. Unless you're full of pride. Amen. It's not hard. You know what you do? You call on the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. And the same thing keeps coming out. The King James has the smallest number of syllables per word, letters per word, words per sentence. And the King James also has something called cognitive scaffolding. One of the textbooks I wrote when I was a professor at the university was called uh, Design Process and Cognitive Behavior. In that book, I talk about how people think and how they learn. But one of the ways children learn is called cognitive scaffolding. That means if I say, the Bible, King James Bible says, uh, be careful for nothing, okay? Care is a small word that has a definition. You care about something. Full, you have a full glass of milk. So a child will put those two words and they will build them together to understand what careful means. Full of care, okay? Now, if you look at the New International Version there, it will say anxious. There is no cognitive scaffolding with the word anxious because it doesn't break down because they don't use Anglo-Saxon words. So I tried to find out why none of these versions use the simple Anglo-Saxon words. And I found out that it has to do with the derivative copyright law. Okay? The derivative copyright law says, quote, to be copyrightable, um, a derivative work must be different enough from the original to be regarded as a new work and must contain a substantial amount of new material. Making minor changes or additions of little substance to a pre-existing work will not qualify the work as a new version. You have to make substantial changes in the version. So here we have the new King James. It's going to pretend that it's going to update all the King James words. For the word evil. Okay, now the word evil will cognitive scaffold for a child to devil. Okay? But they have adversity, distressing, catastrophe, calamity, difficult, harmful, terrible, and doom. I didn't put doom on there. Fat is verdant. Okay? Man is mortal. Old is elderly. Give is gratify. House is habitation. Smell becomes savor. Okay? Why did they do this? Now, there's a book called The NIV Story by Burton Gooder, and he explains why they did it. Because they can't use the King James words. They're the best words, they've already been taken, so they have to go to the thesaurus. Now, if you're doing the New American Standard, you get the first choice, but then by the time you're on to the NIV, you're on the third choice, and by the time you're down to the New King James, you can't take anybody else's words, and you're using these ridiculous words like verdant for fat, okay? <laughs> but I think um, what, when people say the King James is hard to understand, they're really misrepresenting how someone understands the Bible. Uh, Psalm 25 says the meek I want to do a review here of the quick scan King James Bible. This thing is put out by the Berean Bible Publishers. And uh, it's an interesting new twist on Bible perversion. I'm going to show you here what I mean. 
Here we have the Holy Bible, Complete Authorized King James Version in Quick Scan, Berean Bible Publishers. There's the address, the website. Here's what the outside of it looks like. Okay, you can see that. Let me show you some of the stuff in here. <clears throat> Copyright. The reprinting of any parts of the main content and the additions to this Bible without the author's permission is forbidden. Notice it says additions to this Bible. Okay, not E, you know, additions, ah, additions. They are adding things, in other words. You're going to see what things are added here in a minute. But very interesting because here I have my Cambridge, my good old Cambridge Bible. Okay, rights in the authorized King James Version of the Bible are vested in the crown. Does it say anything about uh, you can't copy it, you can't, you know, no part of it can be copied or anything? Uh, no, doesn't say anything about that. The only thing that's quote-unquote copyrighted about this Bible here is the fact that it's a Cambridge. All right, you can't print your own King James Bible and put Cambridge on it. That's what's going on there. But this one because they changed the text, now they can say this thing is copyrighted. Interesting. But let me show you here what they do with what the quick scan scam is. How quick scan benefits you. Quick scan words. By reading the bold words only, you will reduce reading time by up to two thirds, it says. You simply eliminate the necessity of reading about half the words, now look at this, words that can be left out without changing the overall meaning of the text. Words that can be left out without changing the overall meaning of the text. Remember that as I show you in the actual text how they pervert the scripture. But it says here, a consumer of large chunks of you know, but you eliminate uh, left to right, big head or big problem, as many have in reading, and also a consumer of large chunks of your valuable time. So reading the Bible is not part of valuable time. That's a problem. Quick scan also increases the understanding of most readers. Three designations for the devil. One is Lucifer in Isaiah 14, and the other is Satan. When the Lord says, get thee behind me, Satan addressed him personally. And the third one is a, is a generic term, simply means, or simply says, devil. All right, devil is translated from the Greek diablos, which means a slanderer or an accuser. Satan is a transliteration. It's not a translation. It's simply taken from the text and taken over into English. It is a Hebrew word because Satan shows up in the, in the Old Testament time and time again and sometimes it is translated, and sometimes it's not. And sometimes it's translated and says adversary, or what have you like that, but then sometimes not. So it is the name of the devil, Satan. But then there is another name that shows up in the Bible, and that name is Lucifer. In Isaiah chapter number 14, the, name, the word Lucifer is a Latin word. And that word means a shining one or a bright one, or literally Lucifer means a bearer of light. Now, in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 14 and verse number 12, the Hebrew word Hillel shows up one time in the Old Testament. One time right there, Isaiah chapter 14. That in itself is remarkable because it shows that the Holy Spirit is giving you that word and associating that word with this fallen creature. Lucifer. And in Isaiah 14, it's talking about his fall from heaven. And uh, the big, doc, the big, uh, the big uh, argument today in the uh, occult world and now coming into the Christian world, and I use the word Christian very lightly, is that Lucifer is not that bad angel that he's been portrayed to be, but rather he's a good angel and the occult world has always held to this, but now it's coming over into the Christian world. And now this is only getting the foot in the door. The idea is to get you to accept something, a premise. Once you accept that, they build upon it. 
And that's where the problem comes in. Last week we brought up the NIV and some of the places, the NIV, the translations that it's made. And uh, the reason I did that is because the NIV is essentially the granddaddy of all of these new versions as far as usage is concerned. It's more widely distributed and used than uh, any other translation outside of the Bible. Amen. You know, the way I said that. <laughs> but anyway, <clears throat> the NIV is, is the official uh, Bible of, uh, I guess, I don't know if they officially declare it to be, a Southern Baptist church, but a lot of people in there use it, but a lot of fundamental Baptists use it too, and a lot of other people use it. I thought you might be interested in some statistics. Now, I'm not one that's, uh, you know, statistics will burn you up and wear you out, but uh, as you, I don't know if you realize it or not, but the NIV has changed considerably since its first incarnation and to the point to where it is today, which obviously, of course, means that if it has changed up to this point, it will continue to change. And uh, here is a, um, here is some of the statistics that uh, we start with. As, as far as NIV of uh, 1984 up into the present, only 60% of the original NIV has been retained. A full 40% has been changed. Uh, so people say, Brother Hovind, why do you use the King James? Man, it's old English. Nobody can understand it. It's hard to read. I understand all that. And as a brand new Christian, saved out of the Methodist church, uh, I, my mom gave me every kind of new Bible version there was. Well, if a new one came out, hey, son, you're going to love this one. So I've got a huge collection of all the Bible versions. When I was 16, I had the reviled substandard perversion of the Bible. It's here someplace, my original copy. But uh, I was reading that, going to church, going to this little independent, temperamental, fundamental, right-wing, radical, chicken-eating Baptist church. And the preacher was banging on the pulpit saying the Bible's the Word of God. And I was making notes in my revised standard version. And after a couple of months, he said, Brother Hovind, you've been a Christian a few months now. Uh, it's time you get a Bible. I said, I got a Bible. He said, no, you need a real Bible. I was offended. Okay, I thought, well, I got a Bible. I've been making notes. I've been reading it an hour a day. What do you mean? He said, well, there's real problems with that one. So why King James? It's been 33, 37 years now as, as a Christian of you know, studying this topic. Why? Look at Psalms chapter 12. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. What does the word them refer back to in that verse? Thou shalt preserve them. Preserve what? His words. He's promising he's going to preserve his words, right? How about NIV? The words of the Lord are flawless, like silver purified in a furnace of clay, purified seven times. O Lord, you will keep us safe and protect us from such people forever. Is that saying the same thing? I mean, I was born at night, but it wasn't last night. It looks to me like somebody's wrong about this one. Okay? What does this mean? Keep us from such people. What people is it talking about? There are very serious differences between these Bible versions. We've got a book. I don't know if I have it here. It's in our library. It, the guy sent it to me. It took me six months to figure out what the title said. I read it. I said, what? Well, I went out of something else. Every time I look at the book, I said, what is this? The title was, Things That Are Different Are Not The Same. I thought, well, duh. Why would you title a book like that? You know, things that are different are not the same. And then I thought, wow, these Bible versions are definitely different. So you can't say they're the same. There are, as far as I understand it, 151 English translations of the Bible right now available. The law is you cannot get a copyright and therefore protect your work and therefore get more money unless you have 10% different from the original. Are there 151 different ways to say each of the verses in the Bible? At some point, you're going to have to stop saying it the right way and say it the wrong way just to make it different, just to get your copyright, just to get your money. Love of money, root of all evil. Here's a quick story. We could take an hour on this one, but right after the time of Christ, the disciples were writing their books and they were being persecuted and spreading out, you know, and people were copying these letters and copying the Gospels and spreading them out. Persecution hit the church and they spread out everywhere. And for the next thousand years, it was horrible persecution against the church. And if they caught the heretics, the Christians, they would burn them at the stake and burn their Bibles. Well, People were spreading the Word of God around, making all kinds of copies. It takes about 10 months to write out a copy of the Bible using a pen. Now, you don't even have a good ink pen. You've got a feather, and you've got to keep dipping it in the ink and keep cutting a new point on it. You don't even have a good ink pen, nor do you have good paper to write on. 
you know, lumpy parchment, stuff like that, or leather. But anyway, with all the obstacles they had, plus, you know, being persecuted, it took about 10 months to write out, handwrite a copy of the Bible. <clears throat> well, they're making all these copies. By the time you get to 15 and 1600s, persecution lets up, and so people decided to collect the Bible copies together from all over the world and, and compare them and put it into English. Now, keep in mind, some of these copies of the Bible had not seen each other in a thousand years. There might have been people in France that were copying the Bible, and people in Africa copying the Bible, and people in China copying the Bible. And they have, and you can only use a book so long and it wears out. I've got, I don't know how many, absolutely worn out Bibles. Okay? I think I have probably five or six that I've just flat, they're shot. Okay? If you're going to, a book that's in active use is going to have a, a limited life. And let's just pick a number and say, if you were really careful with your scrolls, I mean, treat it real carefully, you might make a scroll last 300 years and still use it every day. Just for illustration. Well, so in 300 years, your original is worn out, it's trash, it's junk, you throw it away. Because you now have, you know, 800 copies of this thing, or a certain large number of copies. Then you take those copies and make copies. And after maybe a thousand years, you might be on your fourth or fifth generation from the original, but that's perfectly fine. It doesn't matter as long as the copying process was accurate. And a good way to check that copying process and see was it accurate is after, you go, after each of these, you know, the French ones and the German ones and the English ones and the Chinese ones, each go five generations. Now let's get the fifth generation and compare them all and see how accurate they are. And that's what happened in the 15 and 1600s. They got all these scrolls together, found 5,000 copies of the Bible that survived the persecution. And they were identical in everything except spelling. People's names, you know, Peter and Pedro, stuff like that had changed. So they said, man, God truly preserved his word. It's, this is it. This is word for word exactly. He preserved it. So, meanwhile, down in Egypt, there was a group of folks, sort of like Jehovah's Witnesses. I've got the Jehovah's Witness Bible here. Um, they were a cult. They came to be known as the Alexandrians. The Alexandrians uh, did not believe in the deity of Christ. They didn't believe in the bodily resurrection. They didn't believe in a lot of Christian things, kind of like Jehovah's Witnesses today. So they made their own copy of the Bible, changing things they didn't like. They made about 6,000 changes. The primary guy in this cult was a guy named Origen. He was the leader of this cult in the uh, late 2nd uh, century, 3rd century. The only mention of Alexandria in the Bible is when they were disputing with Stephen, arguing with the real Christians. And if you trust the principle of first mention, which I think is very important, then that'll be important to you. They say, wow, the only mention of these folks is bad. And so the, anything out of Alexandria, anything out of Egypt, period, in the Bible <laughs> seems to be bad, you know. But Origen started this, or was the primary guy in this cult. They made copies of their Bible also, with their changes in it. And some of them survived. In 350 A.D., several copies were made, and three of those still survive today. One was found in the Vatican Library, and it's called Vaticanus. One was found in Alexandria, Egypt, and it's called Alexandris in the Latin. And one was found in Sinai Peninsula in a monastery. There's this old monastery at the foot of this mountain that some pharaohs or some princess said, that's Mount Sinai, and it's not Mount Sinai, by the way. But uh, she said, oh, that's Mount Sinai. Okay, yes, ma'am. And so they call it Mount, they still call it Mount Sinai. There's still a monastery there. <laughs> it's not in Sinai Peninsula. It's in Arabia. Read Galatians 4. But... Uh, they, they, in this trash can, in this old monastery, this guy was visiting. He said, what's this old scroll? He said, oh, we don't know. It's been in there for years. You know. He pulled it out. It was a copy of the Bible, if you can call it that, from 380, or 350 A.D. And so that one's called uh, uh, Sinaiticus. Well, these three scrolls do not agree with each other on anything, nor do they agree with the real Bible. Okay? They're all different. The uh, Catholics, or the, the monks translated this, uh, these three ancient scrolls into Latin centuries ago, and it became known as the Latin Vulgate. Vulgate for vulgar means the common language, okay? Then the Catholic, by the way, that, the Latin Vulgate was a really good translation of a bad book. Then the Catholics came along in 1582 and translated the Latin Vulgate into English with the Douay Confraternity or the Douay Reims version of the Bible. And that was a really good translation of a bad book. Then two guys named Westcott and Hort came along. I've got their book here someplace on the table. Westcott and Hort came along, and they were going to make a new... Yeah, here we go. The Westcott-Hort-only controversy. A little bitty booklet about... If you want to study this, just two, two bucks from our ministry. Westcott and Hort were two Greek scholars 
uh, I don't know if they were even Christian or not. They probably claimed that they were, like a lot of people do. Okay? But they took these three old ancient, ancient manuscripts. They didn't agree with each other. But their thinking was, these are older, therefore they are better. Well, I'll go along with the older part. I'll agree with that. But ancient manuscripts, they didn't agree with each other. But their thinking was, these are older, therefore they are better. Well, I'll go along with the older part. I'll agree with that. But that doesn't mean they're better. But they synthesized them into one new Greek manuscript and sold it to the world in 1875 and said, we have the oldest and best manuscripts available now for you to translate. And they got the oldest ones all right. The oldest ones that survived is all. Doesn't mean better. Then people started taking their Westcott and Hort version and translating it into English. First one done, 1881, as the Revised Standard, then the American Standard, the Revised Standard, uh, the Revised Version, the Revised Version first, then the Jehovah's Witness Bible, the New World Translation done in 1950. This was a good translation, fairly good translation of a bad book. Then the New American Standard, the NIV, the Good News, the Amplified, the Living Bible, all of those, and I have a lot of them. Here's the New American Standard. Uh, I think the guys who are doing this are sincere, dedicated, highly intelligent, godly Christians who are translating the wrong book and don't even know it. There are basically only two Bibles in the world, in the English. The ones translated from what's called the majority text, the King James, of which there are now 64,000 manuscripts. At the time King James guys did it, they only had 5,000. And then there's the whole other family of Bibles, all translated from the Westcott and Hort. So you have two choices. The question is not, is it a good translation? The question is, what are they translating? Okay? The excellent book uh, by Westcott and Hort, if you want to read about that. Here's, for instance, NIV, Acts chapter 8. Let's see, Adam, read verse 37 to me. Acts 8, 37. I can't do it. You can't do it. <laughs> it's not there. There is no Acts 8, 37. They removed it, and they removed the number, okay? Now, in the New American Standard, they at least put a footnote. In Acts 8, 37, it says, see footnote. But the verse is gone. Down at the bottom, it says, late manuscripts insert verse 37. No, 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 no. Guys, you got it all wrong. Those supposed early manuscripts you're going on are the ones that took it out. It wasn't that the later guys inserted it, it's that the earlier guys took one out, that's all. There are over 200 verses totally missing from the NIV. There's a good book, uh, Understandable History of the Bible, Sam Gipp. Great big book, excellent book, really good on understanding the history of how we got our Bible. Or Gail Ripplinger's book, In Awe of Thy Word. It's like 1,200 pages, and it's only like 15 bucks or 18 bucks or something. Really, really a good one. There are many, many books that we offer on the King James controversy. If you want one that's toned down and kind of, you know, sweet, gentle, and mild, this would be it uh, by Sam Gipp. The Answer Book. Excellent book on why King James. The language of the King James. Why do they use these old words, thee and thou and stuff like that? Oh, there's a good reason for that. But the whole thinking that older is better is simply wrong. And how is Satan going to use these new versions toward bringing in his new world order? Well, this one, the New Age Bible Versions, is excellent by Gail Ripplinger, uh, Ph.D. in English. So older does not mean better. I have worn out many Bibles over my 37 years of being a Christian. Older doesn't mean better. So there are more manuscripts of the Bible than any other old book. Homer's Iliad, for instance, only has about 650 manuscripts. In 1946, they found 24,000 more manuscripts. Then the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, and now they have 64,000 manuscripts that support the King James, and three complete manuscripts and 46 fragments that support the Alexandrian. Then the Isaiah Scroll, found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, was actually a thousand years older than the other manuscripts. So there's plenty of good books available on that. Uh, there are all kinds of things we could talk about on the problems with the King James, or problems with the other versions, like 2 Samuel 21. Who killed Goliath? Who killed Goliath? David killed Goliath. 2 Samuel 21 says, Elhanan, the son of uh, his dad, uh, slew the brother of Goliath. NIV says, Elhanan, the son of the same guy, killed Goliath. This is an error. Okay? It's wrong. <laughs> it's, they blew it. All right? They left out verses, and we could scan through some of these. There's, all these verses are left out. There's a list on the website, avpublications.com, of verses that are left out. 200 verses are simply gone. And those that are the, still in there many times are changed to something meaning totally different. For instance, Hosea chapter 11. Judah yet ruleth with God. NIV. Judah is unruly against God. 
would you say that is saying the same thing? Judah is also unruly against God. It's not saying the same thing. Thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth, Genesis 27. That's one of the blessings. Your dwelling shall be away from earth's richness. Away from the fertility of the earth shall be your dwelling. They're saying the opposite, folks. It's not the same. Proverbs 18. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. What's that mean? If you want to have a lot of friends, then be friendly. NIV. A man of many companions may come to ruin. Are these saying the same thing? Am I missing something here? If you've got a lot of friends, you'll be ruined? <laughs> That's what it says. That's not at all correct. The Bible says in Matthew 7 that narrow is the way. Straight is the gate, and narrow the way that leadeth to life. And few there be that find it. Revised Standard says the gate is narrow, and the way is hard. Wait, is it hard to go to heaven, or just not many do it? Now, they use the these and the thous, and there's a reason for that, and then we'll go on to another subject here. Uh, if a word starts with Y, it is plural. Ye, your, etc., okay? If it starts with T, it is singular, and there's an important reason. Nobody in 1611 was walking down the street saying, How art thou today? They weren't using that. But the King James translators wisely chose to use the these and the thous because of the distinction. If I walk into a room and say, You come with me, does that mean one of you or all of you? You can't tell. But if you use thee and thou, you can tell. You can see in John chapter 3 very clearly. Jesus said to Nicodemus, Marvel not that I said unto thee, singular, ye must be born again. He changed it to plural. I'm telling you that everybody must be born again. That's a really important distinction. Otherwise, he'd be saying, Nicodemus, I'm telling you that you've got to be born again. Well, how does that apply to Kent Hovind? It wouldn't apply. The fact is, it's very precise in the King James. So we can talk all day about that. We'll cover more in our college class. I think the whole concept you need to get in your head is God promised he would preserve his word, so where is it? I would like to hold a copy of it. And after 30-some years, I was slowly dragged, kicking and screaming, screaming into the King James camp. God preserved his word for in English, and we've got it. A couple of verses really attract my attention because of I speak, my speaking on creation all the time. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 9. King James says, To make all men see what is the mystery, the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. There are two important phrases here. It says, from the beginning of the world. That's a definite time. He created things by Jesus Christ. Colossians 1 says the same thing. Jesus created all things. Jesus is God in the flesh. Well, a lot of these new Bible versions uh, come from the Alexandrian, and they did not believe Jesus was God in the flesh. And they, bookstores, of course, want to sell lots of Bibles, love of money, root of all evil, and they don't want to offend anybody. So, hey, let's sell a Bible version that doesn't offend people. So look what they did with Ephesians 3.9. Which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. Well, they left off Jesus. You don't want to offend people, you know. And they made it ages past instead of from the beginning. Nearly all the new Bible versions have changed it to say ages, ages, ages. And they leave off Jesus in every case, except for the new King James. They left Jesus in there, but they still call it ages past. That's the only one I could find that left Jesus in there, but they all changed it to ages. They don't want to get this definite six-day, you know, young earth creationist because they might offend people and, again, lose money. Now, we could spend hours on the different uh, problems with these verses. The last one that bothers me is, is it the first day in Genesis 1-5, or is it one day? Every version that I found says one day. King James says the first day. Why would they change it to one day? Well, again, they're trying to allow for the long periods of time. And I don't understand how somebody can read Genesis 1-5 and still believe there's a gap between verse 1 and 2 of any amount of time, more than an hour. The first day. It couldn't be more clear. I believe the devil wants to take over the church. I believe the devil wants to take over this church. One person at a time.
we have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order. Call your window. Go back inside your house. Go back inside right now. I am inside. We have a real chance at this new world order. An order in which a credible United Nations tasers. can use its peacekeeping role to fulfill the promise and vision of the UN's founders. After 1989, President Bush kept said, and it's a phrase that I often use myself, that we needed a new world order, and instead it looks like we got a lot of disorder. It's been a long time coming because of what we did on this day, at this defining moment, change has come to America. President Obama and British Prime Minister Gordon today calling for a new world order to tackle our global economic crisis. The affirmative task we have now is to actually create a new world order. Its task will be to develop an overall strategy for America in this period when really a new world order can be created. It's a great opportunity. Talk about the new world order defined as you have as being Luciferian. Yes. Um, how do you know that? My investigations led me to look at the back of the American dollar and I found these strange seals on the dollar here. They're Illuminati seals, which was a secret society set up in 1776 by a man called Adam Weishaupt. And on the back of the dollar here, you see the seal on the left-hand side, and there's an eye in the triangle. It's the eye of Horus in Egyptian mythology, now called the eye of Lucifer or Satan. The two words at the top, annua chapters, stand for announcing the birth of, and down the bottom, novus ordo seclorum. And that great seal of the United States has on it, novus ordo seclorum, a new order and people should be asking the question, what is an Egyptian pyramid doing on the back of an American dollar? What link up is there between America and Egypt? The answer is none at all, except in the field of the occult. And thus we see that we're dealing with a Luciferian plan. And people need to recognize the God of Freemasonry will lead the world into this peculiar and particular purpose for which America was set up, which is to lead the whole world system into a one world government, a one world religion, a one world law system, and a one world money system that the Bible calls the mark of the beast. And basically what we know for a fact that there is going to be a changeover from the old order to a new order, a rule by Satan himself. That's what that symbol refers to and that's what the new world order refers to. In the King James, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. Notice how the New English Bible renders this verse. It says, The old order is gone, and a new order has begun. They're using the same language. The King James says, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of the Reformation, talking about Christ's coming, but notice the NIV calls it until the time of the new order. They're preparing people. Now I want you to notice this. In Isaiah 28, 16, in the King James, the Bible says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. This is referring to Jesus, right? And I want you to notice that in the King James, they're telling you that Jesus is the cornerstone of the foundation. Now where's the foundation in relation to a building? On the top or the bottom? It's on the bottom, isn't it? Okay? So when they say that Jesus is the cornerstone of the foundation, that's down here, right? Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, this is the King James, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. Again, on the foundation. Notice that the NIV calls him the capstone. They're saying that that symbol that you see represents Christ. It doesn't. It represents who? Antichrist. 
I pray that you will stay, however, my friends, with this great book, The Word of God. This truly is what we need to turn to. The time is short. A great falling away from the truth. It's happening. It's right here now. My name is Steven Anderson. Secret societies, why we gotta stand for the new world proprieties, the evidence. 